LED grow lights have truly come of age in the last few years, but right now, the market seems somewhat saturated. No Amazon and Alibaba blurple fan boxes to be found here. This is all about developing your power to evaluate any LED grow light. Lots to cover, so let's do this. Check the tech specs for the output of the light, electrical power consumption, and the recommended footprint for flowering, not just vegetative growth. If you can't find info on all of the above, find another supplier and fixture. There's independently verified technical info for many popular fixtures at designlights.org. I've included a link below. As for power, figure a minimum of 500 watts per square meter or 31 watts per square foot of canopy. Better yet, look at the total light output, referred to as PPF or photosynthetic photon flux. If the manufacturer manufacturer or reseller doesn't mention this, move right along. If all you can find is the PPFD, not PPF, once again, move right along. PPF refers to the total amount of light the fixture produces during one second. This is what you need to know, friends. I'm not saying that PPFD isn't important, but any buying decision starts with PPF. For high performance, I recommend a minimum of 1,000 micromoles for each square meter of footprint, or 92 micromoles per square foot. Also, some manufacturers have moved from PPF and now use BPF instead. Yay, more acronyms! Next, check the coverage of the fixture over its claimed footprint. You'll often see light maps like this known as PAR maps or PPFD maps. Compare the highest light intensity in the center of the footprint with the lowest at the corner or edge. If the lowest number is less than half of the highest number, the manufacturer may be overstating the size of the footprint. <laughs> Light-loving flowering plants require 300 to 600 micromoles per square meter in vegetative growth and 600 to 900 in flowering. Anything higher than this will probably require supplemental carbon dioxide. Underpowered LEDs may grow plants fine in the vegetative phase, but the harvest quality will invariably disappoint in both quality and quantity. We'd best move on to the individual diode types and spectral quality. The output of any LED grow light is the compound effect of hundreds, sometimes thousands, of tiny, typically 9 square millimeter diodes. The indoor LED grow light world was revolutionized by the introduction of efficient, full spectrum diodes. Before that, it was all a bit blue and red, aka blurple. First, full spectrum light is not only more pleasant to work with, it's also easier to evaluate plant health and spot pests. But it's what plants have evolved to exploit. Samsung are the kings of full-spectrum LEDs. The LM301H, a mid-power diode, produces 3.1 micromoles per joule. Samsung used different phosphor chemistry to transform what is essentially a 450 nanometer blue chip into either 3K or 5K full-spectrum output. 3K is a warmer white, whereas 5K is a cooler, bluer white. This year, you'll see more grow light fixtures starting to incorporate Samsung's brand new LM301H EVO full spectrum diode based on a 435 nanometer blue chip and slightly higher efficiency at 3.14 micromoles per joule. It's available in five different spectra. Many grow light brands tick Samsung box by incorporating the 3K subtype into their fixtures, where some guys go the extra mile to use a mixture of 3K and 5K for broader spectral coverage. Beware less scrupulous direct-to-consumer outfits using fake Samsung diodes. If a grow light manufacturer is using the name brand LEDs, they should be able to supply a certificate validating them as an official technology partner. To increase overall fixture efficiency and boost red content, known to help improve results in the flowering phase, full spectrum diodes are supplemented with monochromatic red diodes. These are even higher efficiency as there's no need for phosphors. The top tier red diode manufacturer is Osram, known specifically for their Oslon Square Hyper Red Diodes around 660 nanometers. Osram red mono diodes are highly efficient at over 4.1 micromoles per joule. Be wary of any fixtures with too much red though. A desirable ratio for full spectrum to red diodes is around 25 to 1 for use in indoor gardens. Too much red can lead to phototoxicity, bleaching biomass, necrosis, that's dead plant tissue, and eventually mold. Greenhouse LEDs often contain significantly more red and boast higher overall efficiency numbers, 3.5 micromoles per joule and higher. But don't be tempted to use them in an indoor setting. They can get away with more red because they're designed to supplement background solar radiation rather than acting as a sole light source. Osram also offers a highly sought after 730 far red diode in their Oslon range. 
Far red diodes emit radiation at around 730 nanometers and can help to increase leaf size and promote more flowering sites. Reds and far reds need to be balanced with blues, violets, and even ultraviolet LEDs in order to maintain a healthy grow habit and compact overall plant form. It's now more common to find LED fixtures producing radiation all the way down to 395 or 380 nanometers, sometimes as low as 365. Now, this all qualifies as UVA radiation. The UV diode specialists are a company called Seoul, headquartered in South Korea. Next up, form factor and hanging distance. By far, the most popular among hobbyists right now is the multi-array spider style, where multiple light bars and mid-powered LEDs are attached perpendicular to a central body like this, 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 and this. The typical footprint is 4 by 4 or 16 square foot area. That's 1.2 by 1.2 meters. Arguably, this style of LED fixture offers better thermal management than quantum boards. Sometimes the driver or drivers, yes, some fixtures have multiple drivers are housed in this central body, but sometimes it's separate. The latter style is often foldable with non-detaching light bars, versatile enough for top lighting or side lighting, but not so good if one of the light bars goes out as you'll need to return the whole fixture. A typical 600, 660, or 700 watt multi-array LED will generally use eight individual light bars. As such, multi-array LEDs are noted for their light intensity uniformity, but don't be surprised if there's a high PPFD hotspot spot in the center of the footprint. They can get close to the canopy too. 12 inches is often claimed. That's 30 centimeters, but 18 inches or 45 centimeters is a more realistic hanging distance in most cases. As with artificial light sources, growers should always aim to get their lights as close as possible in that sweet spot for maximum light intensity and canopy penetration. Always consider your ceiling grow tent height, fixture hanging distance, final plant height, and grow tray height. LED grow lights for commercial growers tend to use fewer light bars and require a higher hanging distance above the plants, reflecting the fact that these lights will probably be used in warehouses rather than domestic homes and grow tents. Instead of 600 watts being spread over eight light bars, it's common to see the same power spread over just two or four bars instead. Obviously, more distance will be required. Two to three feet is typical for fixtures like this. Some manufacturers go the high power diode route in a more compact form factor. They typically use lenses to throw the light out across the footprint, great for canopy penetration and hitting the flanks of plants. Some light bar designs now incorporate micro reflectors to channel light in an effort to create more incident light intensity and penetration. Moving right along, let's talk about controllability for a second. One of the best things about LED grow lights is their ability to be dimmed without losing spectral quality. In fact, LEDs will run more efficiently at 50% power than full power. Obviously, you'll save on electricity when your plants are young, too. Gradually increasing light intensity is key when growing indoors, so plants can have a chance to acclimate to higher and higher light levels. Many commercial fixtures won't have onboard dimming capability. You'll need to buy an extra 0 to 10 volt dimmer unit, so make sure you factor that into the price. The ability to dim really is a must. It can be very handy if you run short on vertical space too. Beyond dimming is a multi-channel controller. Some manufacturers and resellers are already offering this feature as variable spectrum. This goes way beyond the grow and bloom buttons you see on blurple fan boxes. Instead of one driver running all the diodes, multiple drivers are used to run different diode groups, meaning you can effectively dial in custom spectrums for vegetation of growth, transition, and bloom. Some fixtures afford growers discrete control over UV output too. Variable spectrum LED fixtures give growers a whole new set of tools for plant steering. The downside of multiple drivers is increased cost and the need for a specific controller. Some LED light fixtures offer a Bluetooth 5 and mesh controller, enabling wireless management of multiple grow lights with an app downloaded onto your smartphone instead of a dedicated piece of hardware. Finally, there's protection from heat, dust, and water. Check the IP rating of the unit. IP65 is good for most regular hobby use. IP66 and beyond is good for commercial applications where there might be more power fogging going on. LEDs produce plenty of heat at the backs of the diodes. Heat kills efficiency in diode lifespan and therefore it must be dealt with properly. The high power diodes need fins to dissipate all the heat they generate. The mid power diode setups can get away with less. Don't position your LEDs too close to the ceiling or top of your grow tent. They need adequate space and ventilation above them. Now, I know some of you will be wondering, Everest, what about efficiency? 
I didn't headline efficiency because more and more we're seeing LED grow lights being marketed solely in terms of their efficiency alone. Growers can fall into this trap of thinking that the grow light boasting 2.9 micromoles per joule is intrinsically better than the one with 2.7 micromoles per joule. For one thing, the numbers may be... Uh, rounded up a little. Yes, grow room efficiency is a noble goal, but output and spectral quality is where it's at. Feel free to ask questions or talk up specific LED lights in the comments below. And before I go, heartfelt thanks for those watching and also a special nod of appreciation to my long-term subscribers for being so patient while I took an extended break from uploading. If you want more videos more regularly, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Okay, that'll do. I love you all, but trust only a few. Bye for now.